I'm actually not going to just talk about taco and trolley, but I'm okay. going to cover that. Um, okay. But the, I'm going to present uh, just a little bit of basic background about transfusion reactions here at St. Luke's Hospital, and um, then show you five case studies that I think illustrate some of the more serious transfusion reactions that we've seen. So just to define transfusion reaction, it's really any unfavorable event that occurs either during or after a transfusion of any of the blood components. A lot of times we think it has to do with red blood cells, but we see it with platelets and FFP. Uh, cryoprecipitate at some of the factor concentrates. Um, just to put this in perspective, um, at St. Luke's Hospital last year, we transfused about 7,400 units of red blood cells, uh, almost 1,400 units of platelets, and um, uh, 3,000 units of plasma. And so altogether, we're transfusing close to about 11,000 uh, blood components a year. That's down from a peak of about 16,000 that we used to do um, about 10 years ago. So slowly, we're decreasing our transfusion. This table just lists the uh, estimated risk of a transfusion per unit transfused. It's not per patient, it's per unit. Um, so the most common thing that we see is that when a person comes in and gets uh, transfused with a unit of red blood cells, the next time they come in and we do an antibody screen, it's now positive, and so they formed an antibody to the units of blood uh, that we transfused previously. We routinely type blood for ABO and RH, but there's 300 other blood group systems, and, and we don't type everybody for every blood system. So every time somebody's transfused, it's just like a tissue transplant, they're exposed to a lot of foreign antigens and they make antibodies. Most of the time, these are just only noticed by the blood bank, but sometimes patients actually develop a flu-like illness when this antibody forms, and it's called a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. Um, second most common are the febrile reactions. We see that about one in a thousand units transfused. Um, TACO is uh, transfusion-associated circulatory overload, and that's about one in 2,000. Allergic reactions, about one in 4,000. Um, the big problem is mistransfusion. This is where the wrong unit of blood is given to the wrong person and that's about a, a rate of about 1 in 38,000. And our rate at St. Luke's Hospital almost exactly what the national rate is. Um, a big concern these days is, is a bacterial contamination of platelet concentrates. Platelet is the one unit that we store at room temperature. Everything else is kept either frozen or in the refrigerator. So it's much more prone for bacterial growth if the um, unit is contaminated during the collection. Um, and about 1 in 75,000 units is contaminated. There are measures in place to, to catch this, but sometimes we don't catch it until after the unit's already been transfused. Um, KU has had two fatal uh, bacterial contamination reactions in the last two years. Luckily, we haven't had any here yet. Uh, hemolysis, an acute hemolytic reaction, is also one of the more scary reactions that I have to deal with, and that's about 1 in 100,000 units transfused. Um, hepatitis B is about 1 in 200,000, and then the, from there it becomes almost um, mathematically calculated. We, the risk is so small. Um, for hepatitis C and HIV now, it's, it's, these are estimated risks because it just doesn't happen anymore. This is a summary of the transfusion reactions that we have at St. Luke's uh, each year reported to the blood bank. I know this is an underestimation. Um, I think more actually occur that don't get reported. But roughly, we get about 25 reactions a year reported to the, hot, to the blood bank. And as you'd expect from that list of relative frequencies, um, febrile reactions is the most common thing that gets reported to us. Um, allergic reactions, uh, we do get about, we had three delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions this last year. We had two cases of trolley and two cases of taco. Um, and um, I'll show you how the incidence of, of trolley is, is dramatically going down with some of the most recent interventions that have been taken. There are a lot of different types of uh, transfusion reactions, and a lot of people classify them differently. I like to think of them in two different buckets. One is the early onset, uh, which are the ones that are occurring right at the time the unit is being transfused. And then we have the late onset, where the patient may develop a, a, a problem several months, weeks or months after the transfusion. So today I'm going to talk about uh, some examples of both of these. I'm going to talk about an acute hemolytic uh, case, 
a trolley case, a taco case, and then I'm also going to talk about a, a really fascinating case we had here of uh, post-transfusion hepatitis um, that just happened in the last year. I'm going to start out, is anybody here from uh, neonatology? I just wanted to talk about <clears throat> this first case that involves a baby. Um, it was, uh, the mother was a 27-year-old female. During her first pregnancy, um, she was Rh negative, so she was given Rogam at 28 weeks. She had an uneventful delivery, but um, the baby shortly after delivery developed uh, petechia and was found to have a very low platelet count of about 5,000. And it was diagnosed that the baby had neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia. Um, and what this means is that the, the mother had formed antibodies to the baby's platelets. This is just like hemolytic disease in the newborn with red cell and it involves platelets. So that the mother had formed an antibody to the baby's platelets. The antibody crossed the placenta and destroyed the baby's platelets. Um, and and uh, we actually detected antibody that's called uh, human platelet antibody one uh, that confirmed that's what the baby had. And then the baby uh, was managed with platelet transfusions and, and did fine. The problem with this condition is, is that once you have it in one pregnancy, you're probably going to have uh, other affected pregnancies um, down the road. So during her second pregnancy, she was referred to our perinatology department at 22 weeks because of this history of this alloimmune thrombocytopenia. At that time, we did um, our usual antibody screen that we do uh, during pregnancy workups, and we found that she also had antibodies to anti-D and anti-C red cell antibodies. So now she had not only this history of neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia, but she's also at risk of RH uh, hemolytic disease. Her blood type was AB negative. The father's blood type was group O. So we knew from this, assuming that he is the biological father, um, that the baby was probably going to be either group A or group B. Um, we, we do antigen typing on the father, and we showed that the father had the big D and the big C antigens, which um, uh, would mean that the baby probably is going to have big D and big C, which is a problem now because the, those are the antigens to which the mother has formed antibodies. And so we knew this baby is probably going to be affected by hemolytic disease. Uh, we also um, knew that the baby's platelets were positive for this HP1, so we knew that the baby was going to be at risk of also having this thrombocytopenia. So when the uh, perinatologists discussed this case, um, they knew that there's a, a fairly significant risk of doing serial fetal blood sampling and transfusions. It's about a 6% mortality, fetal mortality. The other big problem is, is when they're going in and drawing blood out of the cord or transfusing, a lot of blood leaks out of the baby's circulation, gets into the mother's circulation, and that sensitizes the mother even more to these red cell antigens. And we've seen uh, red cell antibody titers that normally would be about 160 in strength go up to over a million. Um, and then there's also the risk that since this baby might have a low platelet count, that every time you're sticking a needle in here, there's risk that the baby's going to hemorrhage. So they decided on a very conservative management plan. They were going to do weekly ultrasound, and they're going to measure the middle cerebral artery peak velocity. Um, and this is, I'll show you what this is in a second. Um, and then they treat the uh, baby with intravenous immune globulin, or the mother with intravenous immune globulin. And that's <coughs> supposed to immunosuppress the baby and so they won't form as much, many antibodies. Um, and they're going to delay this fetal blood sampling as long as they possibly could. This is the middle cerebral artery peak velocity that they measure by ultrasound. And what they're actually doing is just measuring how fast the blood is flowing through this artery. And it's inversely proportional to the degree of anemia. The more anemic the baby is, the faster the flow, um, and vice versa. So it's a very good way uh, to show fetal distress. And we actually have a curve that's set up based on weeks gestation. Um, if the baby is uh, perfectly normal and has no anemia, then we get a lower middle cerebral artery uh, velocity. If the baby has mild anemia, it jumps up here. If they have severe anemia, they're up in this zone. And so this is what the baby's record looked like. Um, started out that they were in this zone C, meaning the baby was not anemic at all up until uh, 28 weeks, 5 days. 
And then all of a sudden, on the 29th week, you can see the peak velocity jump from 0.39 to 0.53. And then it went on up from there the next week. So um, they sent a sample down to the blood bank at that time. And what they found was that the, the baby's anti-D titer had now jumped from 1 to 16, which it was prenatally, now up to 1 to 256. And so that's probably explaining why the baby's becoming more anemic. The mother's formed more antibody, the baby's having more cells destroyed, becoming more anemic, that's making the peak velocity go up. So they decided at that point they had to transfuse the baby, uh, do a fetal transfusion. And our standard practice is that we always give group O negative red blood cells because we usually don't know the fetus's blood type. And group O is a universal donor. When they did that, uh, we actually measure the hematocrit uh, in the uh, delivery room while they're doing this before and immediately after. And the baby's hematocrit increased from 30 to 36 percent and the peak velocity went down from 0.64 down to 0.40. We don't have a way to do platelet counts in the delivery room uh, and so they just assumed that since this baby was at risk of the thrombocytopenia we should go ahead and give 15 milliliters of platelets at the same time we're giving the red blood cells just to avoid having to do another transfusion in the future if the baby should become thrombocytopenic. Um, and since we gave group O negative red cells to the baby, we also gave group O platelets. So 12 days later, the mother noticed that the baby's fetal movements had all almost completely disappeared. And she came into the uh, perinatology unit and they did a peak velocity. Well, it had tripled, it had gone clear up to 1.1. So this is very severe anemia. The uh, fetal heart rate tracing showed a sinusoidal patterning indi indicating that there was significant fetal hypoxemia. And so they did an emergency C-section and they delivered a 1900 gram baby and the APGAR scores were normal after five minutes and the accord pH was fairly normal. So the baby did not appear to be in terrible distress. But when we did a hemoglobin, the baby's hemoglobin was only three and it should have been 17, 18. Um, and the baby's platelet count at birth was 258, but within six hours it had dropped down to 71,000. And the baby also had a very high cord bilirubin level of 10, um, which it makes sense because the baby was destroying so many red blood cells. At that time we were able to get a fetal blood type and we found out the baby was group B. Um, and we didn't see any evidence that, the, that there had been a fetal maternal hemorrhage. There was no evidence of a retroplacental hemorrhage. And the amniotic fluid appeared clear, so we knew the baby wasn't bleeding. So we decided that the loss of hemoglobin had to be solely attributed to hemolysis. The baby was supported with multiple red cell transfusions and platelet transfusions. Um, he got five different red cell transfusions and five different sets of platelets. Also, the baby was maintained on erythropoietin and then phototherapy for the high bilirubin level and was hospitalized for a total of 29 days. Um, so what happened in this case and why did this baby become so anemic? <clears throat> well, what we think happened in this case is that we treated the fetal anemia with the group O red blood cells. We didn't have a platelet count available in the delivery room. And so we routine, we just prophylactically gave these group O platelets. Um, but what happened is the baby's blood type turned out to be group B. And when you give group O red cells, it's not a problem because there's very little plasma in a unit of red blood cells. But when you give group O platelets, there's a lot of plasma in a, a set of platelets. And if you're group O, you have anti-A and anti-B in your plasma. And so we think what happened in this case is when we gave this much, uh, 15 mils of uh, plasma in that unit of platelets, it actually bound the group B red cells to the baby and hemolyzed those cells, in addition to the anti-D antibody that the mom had formed, which is already destroying the baby's Rh positive red blood cells. So this was kind of an interesting case of a fetal hemolytic transfusion reaction that really was iatrogenic, and we just didn't think through. Um, at the time, uh, giving the group O platelets, we assumed that was a normal thing to do since we were giving group O red cells, but we didn't take into account that um, the baby's blood type might be group B or group A and that that um, could cause hemolysis. 
This case was also uh, so interesting to Dr. Yates, we actually wrote it up and published it uh, a few years ago because we just wanted to warn other people because this is the